This sermon comes from a request from one of our sisters regarding purity of speech. I think we all recognize that the Bible talks about, especially the New Testament, that we are to be pure and that that purity is one that is taught by the New Testament. It's not just what we think it is, but what the Lord thinks it is and is revealed to us in His Word. Reading from Titus 2, 11 and 12, Paul said to the young preacher, For the grace of God that bringeth salvation hath appeared to all men, teaching us. Let me emphasize that. The grace of God came teaching us that denying ungodliness and worldly lust, that's the thing we're to deny, to be against, to oppose. Then he said, here's what you should be. We should live soberly, righteously, and godly in this present world. Those are general statements, but the details of them are found elsewhere in the scriptures as to our daily conduct. In this text, uh, Paul says that the grace of God teaches. A lot of people who think about being saved by the grace of God, the favor of God that we don't merit, cannot earn, they don't realize that it teaches. It teaches through the New Testament of Christ. If ever there was anything that was produced by the favor of God that man did not deserve, why it's the Bible itself. For it communicates us, to us, the will of God, the way of salvation, 2 Timothy 3, 16 and 17. It teaches us, in this passage Paul telling Titus, it teaches us that we're to deny ungodliness, worldly lust. It teaches that we're to live soberly, righteously, and godly. We are surrounded by a world of profanity. I've seen it become, and you have too if you've lived very long, become far worse in the last 30 years, but even worse in the last 10 years, than it was when I was growing up in the 50s and 60s. That's not to say that there was enough of that going on then, and I put quotations around enough. But it means as the world has gone more material, more secular, more outright opposing God and the Bible and the Christian way of life, Christian conduct, then profanity has become something that is not only engaged in when somebody loses their temper and they haven't taught any better or they're angry at someone else. They let go a string of words. We used to say it would make the air around you blue trying to say how bad it was. But it's just used by anybody to punctuate anything nowadays. And it seems to me it's uh, about as bad as it can be. I don't know how it could be any worse unless more and more people used it. But there's a host of people who readily use it now and think nothing about it. I remember the time when people who did use it regularly would not do it around a woman. Well, nowadays, a woman <laughs> may be more involved in using it than a man, or at least equally involved in it. I looked this up concerning profanity just to see what would be said in various dictionaries. It says profanity, also known as cursing, cussing, swearing, bad language, abusive language, foul language, obscenity, explicitives, vulgarism, or vulgarity. It just simply says it is a socially offensive use of language. Now, I read that and I thought, 
what standard are they going by to determine what is a socially offensive use of language? I don't believe they're going to say the Bible and the Bible only, rightly divided is the only way you can learn how to please God in whatever you do, including your language. They're not going to say that. But they go ahead and say, accordingly, profanity is language used that is sometimes deemed rude. <laughs> That's a mild way of putting it. What's rude? And what times are there that it's rude and what times it's not? And then it adds obscene, culturally offensive in certain religions that constitute sin. Now think about that. So not all religions wherein the members of that religion use obscenities or curse or cuss, does it constitute sin? Well, I believe that more and more. I watch, as I've told you many times before, for my entertainment, I turn on YouTube a lot of times when I can't watch something that worth watching on television but the problem is the same thing there except that there's so much of it that you can dodge it sometimes and because they're seeking followers a lot of them try to be what they would call more family oriented so they're still trying to do what television doesn't care what it does or not and movies don't for sure so they try to quote clean it up unquote But I've seen, there's, there's a couple, I stopped watching one, wasn't because of any language thing, it's because the women there always appeared on it, uh, had some little clothes on, I just stopped watching it. I watch it because it's fishing, and I like to watch fishing. I don't get to do much of it anymore, but they really have some good fishing shows, and it's different. But I've noticed there's two people on there, two families, they're brothers. And they have their own YouTube channels and it's all about fishing. And of course, when you get up about 100,000 followers, you're making pretty good money. And most of them get up about 100,000 and, and they stop and go into it full time. And it's one of them has almost two million, so he's sending in money. But they both, on their individual programs, show no respect when it comes to their wives and the clothes that they don't wear. But the other thing is, they'll have people around them using language, and then they will too. But then they always have a catch and cook, or you just catch cleaning cook, and they're showing you how to prepare the meal. And these two in particular will gather around the table with their children, and they pray to God. And they thank God for this, the safety of the trip and the food, and ask to be guided and directed. And all out of the same mouth comes forth, as James put it, uh, cursing and praising. Here they are going through their program, and yet they're praying to God while they go ahead and use language that the Bible does not authorize, does not condone. In fact, the Bible forbids it. Now, to me, that's where we are among a lot of religions. They give lip service to God on a lot of things. But then they go ahead and live like the world. We look around us, and where you work, where you go to school, I dare say, though I don't know anything about the people you work with, that they're going to use that kind of language or worse. And the youngest of children are very educated in the foulest of terms. One of the things that I noticed back in my day, my grandfather on my mother's side was not a member of the church, never was a member of any church. But they raised chickens, and they had little bantams, and they were always trading something. And there's a little bantam called a golden sea bright. He always had those around. <clears throat> well, they went over to 
a service station owned by a member of the church who was an elder of the congregation where we had gone. And my grandfather's nothing as far as caring about anything like that. We would call him a good moral man, but when it came to using foul language, if you wanted to see the uh, encyclopedia of words that he had in foul language, getting behind his mule when he was when he was plowing it, then, uh, uh, well, let's put it this way. They thought in those days a lot of folks, you couldn't plow a mule without cussing. <laughs> and the uh, sad part about it was there was my grandmother with him at this elder's filling station, place of business, they were trading chickens, and the elder let go with a few words himself. And I was just a little fellow, and I remember that catching me off guard. Later on, when I was in high school, I worked at the paper mill, or rather in the college, and a man I had known back for a good long time, because he had gone to church at one of the congregations, and he worked at the paper mill. And after I got working out there, I came across him one day, and he was talking to somebody else, and uh, he was uh, using a few choice words that weren't nice. And, you know, these are not things they have just stumbled into once in a while. You know they use them regularly. But they've learned to use them where other people aren't hearing them that might make the difference. And that's the way it's been, but nowadays the encyclopedia of terms have just gotten to the point and the routine with which they're used that I don't even know that some people know they're actually using foul gutter language because it's such a part of them. And there's one thing for sure, it's not being taught as to how God is opposed to profanity. I read again, it can show a debasement of someone or something or be considered an expression of strong feeling towards something. Some words may also be used as intensifiers. Well, I would say that's one way to describe it, I guess, formally. The term derives from the older, more literal sense of profanity. This refers to sacrilege or a lack of respect for things that are held to be sacred, which implies anything inspiring or deserving of reverence as well as behavior, showing similar disrespect or causing religious offense. Our background, at least older ones of us, has been in a society, especially in the South and the culture, where people believed in God and Christ and the Bible, and they gave at least lip service to purity of speech. Yet they euphemized, I guess is a word for it, <laughs> uh, things that were sacred. And so they went along in what I heard regularly growing up, and I don't know about you, but people just didn't think about it. And you hear, my Lordy, or oh Lord, or Lordy mercy, or golly, or gosh, or for goodness sake, and stuff like that, or my heavens, or for heaven's sake. Where did we learn to use those terms like that? You know, to speak of heaven is to speak of God's dwelling place. And since there is but one good, one person that's good or one being that's good and that's God, then what do we mean for goodness sake? I realize sometimes you can use some of these things in a proper way. When you think about he that believeth and is baptized shall be saved, he that believeth not shall be damned. I like that a lot better than others that says condemned. No, those in hell are damned. They're going to be there forever. All hope is lost. And they're in torment that no man in this world can ever begin to understand as punishment for their sin. There's no let up. They are in the realm of the damned. And that needs to be understood. But then the way that it's used as a swear word, uh, it can be used in all sorts of ways. And most of the time it doesn't even make any sense. That was blank good. And they may use the word damn there. Well, how? <laughs> That doesn't make sense. But a lot of it doesn't. What are we to do about these things? 
Well, I suggest to you that everything about the Bible, and I don't know what terms they had in Greek. <laughs> I could, you could find out. But I know they weren't any different from us. Uh, if you just uh, look at uh, Pompeii, and you look at what's scribbled all over the walls, various things that came, they were as adept at least as we are, if we haven't surpassed them in foul language and profanity and pornography and every other thing, man's always been able to do that. Uh, the idea of curse, though, as it's used in the scriptures, is where you actually pronounce a curse on somebody. Like an old silly song of years ago, may the bird of paradise fly up your nose. May your wife be plagued with runners in her hose. Well, that's a funny thing, but people in those days did pronounce curses on folks. That's different from the old-fashioned cussing that involves the Lord's name in some way or the other, or other kinds of foul language. It's important to understand that when you're baptized into Christ correctly, the very things that preceded baptized, that, uh, baptism that qualified you to be baptized was belief and repentance, belief in Christ. And that you're a raised to walk in newness of life person, newness of life. And we find back over in the Old Testament, the third commandment is, Thou shalt not take the name of the Lord thy God in vain. And that directive is in the New Testament also. Now we have to go back again and emphasize the meaning of vain. It means pointless, emptiness, useless. You don't use God's name or sacred matters as my words. Then there are those words that are just filthy language. I call them sewer ditch words. The word that's come to the forefront that just grates on my nerves, I will not pronounce. I will simply call it the F word. I have never seen people use that word as often and as commonly as they do in these days. I don't know what's going on with people other than they're far away from God and understanding God in godly living. People need to be told that's wrong. I remember I changed roommates in college when I was in state school. This fellow was a few years older than me and he used GD, GD this and GD that. And I told him, I said, use it one more time and I'm gone. I don't know what made any difference or not. But he used it one more time and I was gone. <laughs> Moved in with the young man who's a, like me, older man nowadays, who was a member of the Lord's church. I think if we're going to be the leavening for good as the Bible defines the good as Christians are to be in this world, we're going to have to tell people that. You're, first of all, you're shocked them to the core. Would you please not use that word around me? It's offensive. Now, understand we're living in the time when people feel perfectly free to say, what you're doing is offending me. Well, if they can do it on something that shouldn't offend anybody, I can do it on something that offends God and God's people. That offends me. Please don't use it. They may not like it. They may get mad. They may, well, what are they going to do about it? But if you're a timid soul and, you know, you're so fired up and serving God that you can't even... Say, stop when you're using my Father's name in vain. That tells me something about how much love you really have. Now, if your own father or mother or family member was having their name used in vain, like people do God's, around you, what would you do? Say nothing. Just let them use your family member's name in a vain, uncouth, way. I wouldn't. I don't know about you, but I wouldn't. 
well, what about us as the family of God and use of Jesus' name and the matter of God's name? We must then realize that whatever is to be revered spiritually and respected, we are in sin when we use it in an irreverent and disrespectful way. And we need to recognize that. Turn with me over to what Paul had to say to the Colossians. Remembering he wrote to the church. And let's see what he had to say and what we can glean from it in Colossians 4 and verse number 6. Now, this is another one of those passages that doesn't give you each particular thing that's a bad word and then don't use it. It simply says, let your speech be always with grace, favor, seasoned with salt, that ye may know how to answer every man. Obviously, our words are to be measured. Words have meaning. What we say to somebody else ought to have meaning. It ought to be something that conveys what ought to be heard. If it doesn't mean that, I don't know what the passage means at all. And this passage demands that you know other parts of the Bible that teaches you about purity of mind. As the Lord in one of the Beatitudes said, Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. And remember, out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaketh. So if you're speaking pure words, it's because you have a pure heart. Now, I promise you, the more you hear this stuff, the more you're around it, the more you will find yourself letting it cross your mind those words all of a sudden pop up in your mind. And you won't like it because you're a godly person. Well, why does it pop up in your mind? Because evil companionship does what? Corrupts good morals. And we're talking about speech, sound speech, pure speech, speech that becomes one who is of Christ, a new creature in Christ. Well, let's go back over to the Ephesians epistle or the epistle to the Ephesians. And let's look at chapter 4 there just for a moment. Now, remember all of these books, their instruction to tell us how to live faithful, how to be pure in heart, how to be godly. In Ephesians 4 and verse 29, let no corrupt communication proceed out of your mouth. You mean a person can't figure out what is corrupt communication? Then he says, but that which is good to the use of edifying, that's spiritually building people up, that it may minister grace or favor unto the hearers. You mean these various words of which we're all familiar, and I don't even have to give you an example of by saying them. We don't know about those. Well, I'm speaking today as if all people in the church who are godly wouldn't use these anyway, but I know for a fact they're members of the church who do. And thus, they need to be reminded, you're sinning when you do that. And I don't know what to tell you as to what the outcome would be if as a teacher or somebody you're around, you were to say, we don't use those words in here. They're wrong. Good people don't use them. Because those children may go back home and say, Mama said don't do that. And they may be telling their mama and daddy, or a teacher said don't do that. They may be saying to their mama and daddy, my teacher said people that use words like that aren't good people. Well, they just have to deal with it. You see, sometimes we're trying our best to teach the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth by our conduct and by normal modes of teaching, but we don't want it to bother anybody, and we don't want it to come back on our own heads. 
there's ways to do things, but that, that can be ways that you get some things across. But you're getting the truth across, and there's only so many ways that you can do that. Going also to Ephesians 5, in three verses in chapter 5 of Ephesians. First of all, in uh, verse number 3, but fornication and all uncleanness or covetousness, let it not be once named among you as become of saints. Then verse 4, neither filthiness nor foolish talking nor jesting, there's hand signals, which are not convenient, but rather giving of thanks. I don't know what they may have had in those days of hand gestures and various things. Different cultures have different things that way people say bad things to one another. So he doesn't list it here, but it covers everything like that. And why should a person who is sound in the faith and all that the Bible means by that and is concerned about being the leavening of the good as the Bible defines the good in the world as a member of the church, why shouldn't they be concerned about the kind of words they use? In verse 12 here, for it is a shame even to speak of those things which are done of them in secret. Now that gets right down to how you even are discussing things that bad people do. It even says here there's a way to do that. Isn't it interesting that when you read the inspired word that's designed to lead, guide, and instruct us in all good things, all spiritual things, that it, it can discuss the most intimate things and some of the t most terrible things, but it does it in a way that itself doesn't violate the very points it's making. Well, I know these verses are in the Bible for me. I know I'm to learn something from them. I know it's a part of the whole counsel of God and is to preach, be preached to you. I know it pertains to things that have to do with life and godliness. So what do we do about these type of things? Now, you may say, well, what can I do to stop these things around me? Well, first of all, you just don't use them. Let people hear you speak and they don't, never hear this fall from your lips of any kind. Any kind of slang or whatever else is ruled out. And the next thing, don't be afraid where you've got the opportunity to say, do I really have to hear it? Is there a reason you say that around me? Do I have to hear it? Now, you may get somebody upset. You may hear more of it then than ever. Or they may go to the whoever it is in the business you have but how do you think we ever get people to change or to think about things if we don't do it? Folks, you've got to bear your cross and follow Christ. You can't serve Christ in every aspect, all day long, everywhere, and not incur some people's anger or being upset with you in some way. Why was Christ Jesus my Lord crucified? It certainly wasn't for anything wrong he said or did or how he said it. It was because he was right in everything. So you're going to have to be wise enough as a child of God to know how you're going to say these things to people. But you need to say them. You need to do something if you're going to get it stopped. Colossians 3, verses 5 through 11. For if a man know not how to rule his own house, how shall he take care of the church of God? I'm sorry, I'm in the wrong place. I said that's I said in Colossians, I'm in Timothy, first Timothy. Although you know that pretty well fits. If a man doesn't know how to rule his own house, <laughs> he's not going to be too interested in how to teach his children what they ought to say and ought not say. But turn with me over to the scripture I wanted in the first place. In Colossians chapter 3. And I will comment further on that regarding the man ruling his own house. What all does that involve? I know this. And in 
involves teaching and training because of what's said in Ephesians 6. Of fathers raising up their children in the nurture and admonition of the Lord. That's going to involve then Colossians 3, verses 5 through 11. And he thought about that, so I misquoted on that verse. Colossians 3, 5 through 11. Mortify, therefore, your members which are upon the earth, fornication, uncleanness, inordinate affection, evil concupiscence, and covetousness, which is idolatry. Who has a New King James Version and can read loud enough for a whole crowd to hear? Can you read loud enough for the whole crowd to hear? Would you read? Now, do you understand between reading the old King James and hearing the new King James read what's being said there and how it covers profanity and ruling it out in any foul language? I would say most foul language is covered by being unclean, unclean stuff. How that we are also inordinate means unlawful affection and so on. But I go ahead and read. For which things sake the wrath of God cometh on the children of disobedience. Maybe you could find a scripture to somebody when they're using language like that. Say, would you mind reading that real slow and think about it while you read it? Of course, the Bible may mean nothing to them. God may mean nothing to them. But after all, aren't we trying to change people? Get people to believe in God and Christ and the gospel? How do you do that if you never confront them on what they're doing or not doing? In verse 7, in the which ye also walked in some time when you lived in them. Why, these Colossians were Gentiles. They were mixed up in all this kind of thing. Well, he's saying you changed. I wonder why they changed from being this way. Because they understood there's a difference to the way the world lives and what they say, how they think, and their viewpoints and the way Christians live. Notice, now ye also put off all anger and wrath and malice, blasphemy, filthy communication out of your mouth. That covers it if I never read any other, any other verse. Is it reading any different there, Ken? Language than yeah, language, filthy language out of your mouth. Lie not one to another, seeing that ye have put off the old man with his deeds and have put on the new man. There it is. Put on the new man, which is renewed in knowledge after the image of him that created him. Where there's neither Greek nor Jew, circumcision or uncircumcision, barbarian, Scythian, wander free, but Christ is all and in all. I don't believe people have a difficult time understanding that if you're really going to live like the Bible says, you're going to clean up your act. If they do, then you have to work on them harder. Evidently, some of my brethren who have no problem assembling like this, observing the Lord's Supper, and at least going through the motions, then going back out in the work week or as a student somewhere and falling right into line with the way of the world. So these things need to be taught. Now as to what I can say further to anybody trying to correct somebody else, obviously you've got a leg up on with the people in your household than you would somebody outside your household. But you can't tell me there's not something that you can't say to get people's attention. They may never quit it except when they're around you. And while I'd like to see them obey the gospel, be as faithful as they can, quit it anywhere, if that's what it takes to stop them from using it around me where I have to hear it, fine. That's what we'll do. I've told you, and I guess it'd be good to use it here again, what I did with the fellow when I drove up, when we lived in Moralton and drove up to a 
car salesman place, and the old man was cussing. GD this and GD that all over the place. And I was trying to find the owner. I asked where he was, and the old man did. He just it was just interspersed in his language. I don't think he even knew what he was saying. Because when he got through, I decided, well, I'll try something here. I said, do you pray to God like that always? Well, it caught him back because he's not thinking about what he's saying. He's just cussing. <laughs> he said, kind of stumbled over his words. He said, what? I said, do you pray to God like that all the time? He didn't think about himself praying. He certainly knew he was cussing. He said, what do you mean? I said, you've been asking God to damn this and asking God to damn that. Do you pray to him all the time or do you pray something else for him to do? Now, what was he going to say? I guess he could have pulled a gun and shot at me or thrown rocks at me, but most people aren't that way. Rather than I say to you, not because I did it, but because of what motivated me to do it. If we don't start doing things like that around people, we're never going to show them we're any different than they are, or the truth really doesn't amount that much to us. But the big thing they want us to think is, if that's what you want to do, that's the way you want to live, that's fine. Just don't bother me with it. Well, when we start bothering people with it, underscore the word bothering, with anything, we're going to do it. There's a whole lot of things you don't have to bring up to try to keep peace, but it may also keep you out of heaven. There's some things you need to say to people to get them to understand. Maybe it's Christians don't do that. Then they may say, well, I know a fellow that's a Christian. God tried to tell me a pharmacist when I was in Van Buren. Went down to the pharmacist to pick up some stuff. And he started to tell me a dirty joke. And I recognized the way he was starting, where it was going. And I said, I don't want to hear that. You know what his comment was? A certain, certain denominational preacher didn't mind hearing it. I said, that's between you and him and God. But I don't want to hear it. <laughs> tell me that's not the way to do it. No, well, that's not the way to do it. Well, then tell me how to do it. How do you impact the world? How do you show you really mean what you're talking about? If you don't see situations like that where you can say something. Well, I'm going to close here because I don't know how to stop it other than the church teaching the truth and us as individuals where we are saying things, doing things to make people think. You never know what you're going to do. There's too many people that don't even have any contact with God or been raised that way. They don't know any better. They may know it's not all acceptable, but I'm beginning to think a lot more don't even think it's wrong because they've had grandparents and parents and all their family using all sorts of words, and those folks never go to church or else they do some kind of church. But that's just common terminology, and we're expected to be the light of the world. We've got to be able to say something. And remember, the church... That means you and me, if you're a member, is a teaching, primarily a teaching institution. And we've got to show what we mean. Uh, you can have, I've had a few folks look like I was going to have to run to get away from them, some of the things I've said. But I look forward to those type of situations. I don't mean to get knocked in the head, but opportunities to teach. Folks, we have a view, and I'm going to close on this. We have a view that to teach somebody, you've got to be sitting in the living room, their Bible's open, and they're sitting there in a class, and you're carrying them through a systematic study. Well, of course, that's true. But how many times as you read through Jesus' teaching, did just a few comments flow from his mouth? I'll give you, I, I just, I've got to give you this one. I'm going to drag out a little longer than I said I would. The woman at the well. You remember what she reported when she went to her city, the town, the village, after she had had the conversation. The thing that impressed her, come see a man that told me everything I'd ever done. That's what hit her. And the whole town came out to see. And the Lord abode with them two days because they asked him to stay with them and teach. 
come and see a man who told me everything I've ever done. Well, we know from reading, there's a lot more discussed there between them than that, but that's all she went back and said. My point is, you don't have to have a class of 30 minutes duration every day to be able to say you've had an opportunity to teach or get their attention. And certainly our Lord is the master teacher, teaches that because he did that kind of thing all the time. Thomas, he sees Thomas. He says, behold, an Israelite in whom there is no guile. Well, Thomas said, says, well, how do you know me? I saw you when you was on the fig tree. Well, what did he mean I saw you? Because he wasn't around him. And Thomas believed him, my Lord, because it was what he knew in his mind, being God, that he knew of him. Just a comment like that. But we're too busy trying to keep peace with everybody because we equate harmlessness with holiness. And everybody liking us means we're all right. And people go on in their sins and they continue to break them. So if you're going to be a, an evangelist, a teacher of the truth, a spreader of the gospel, a sower of the seed of the kingdom, then we have to look for these things in people. It was said of Stonewall Jackson because they had terminologies like we do today. Have you ever noticed how many people will be talking about something and I'm telling Jonathan who, here and I'm trying to tell him, I said, you know, blah, 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 you know, blah, blah. Well, Jackson was a man who took everything very literal. He said people get him at some sort of get together and they'd be talking and they'd say, you know, and he'd interrupt and say, no, don't believe it do. Well, we need to interject some things. We need to interject some things when the opportunities come along. You know what I'm talking about? No, I have no idea what you're talking about. There's a lot of things that we let slip that doesn't take a Ph.D. from Harvard, or for that matter, an A.A. degree from Lone Star <laughs> to be able to do it. Just a matter of how much you want to and how much we know we should. If you're not a Christian, I think everybody here knows the way to become a Christian. If you haven't, now's the time to do it because you don't have any other time. As a child of God, if you've sinned, we urge you to repent of them and confess them and pray God for forgiveness. And do so now while we stand and sing.